Good evening, everyone. My name is Kai Byron, and I'm currently a first year in the Liberal Studies program here at NYU Washington, DC, as well as the Communications Manager for NYU DC Dialogues. DC Dialogues is a student-led group that seeks to engage students and the local community in key discussions on politics, culture, business, environment, education, science, and more. We've invited you all here tonight in hopes that this program will cultivate an evening of education and much needed conversation on the topic of police violence, for it plagues many Americans each day and mustn't go unnoticed. Despite years of advancement and progressive movement that many have sacrificed their lives for in order for people who look like me to be speaking before you tonight, America is still perpetuating the same racial challenges. And it's important that we recognize that the very privilege of being able to have conversations like these in this safe space. In light of the Black Lives Matter movement and recent headlining stories of black and brown folks losing their lives unjustly at the, laws, at the hands of law enforcement, the issue of police brutality, while it never left, is brought again to the surface. Police brutality and police shootings of unarmed people of color has become an epidemic in our country, whether it be systemic, ideological, interpersonal, internalized, or institutionalized. Oppression and racism is very much intertwined in the fabric of the United States. Thank you for joining us tonight as we break down and analyze this problem and what we can do to enforce change. On behalf of the university, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program moderated by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Jonathan Capehart of the Washington Post's editorial board. Also joining us is writer, lawyer, activist, and activist Andrea Ritchie, currently a researcher in residence on race, gender, sexuality, and criminalization at the Social Justice Institute of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. After the discussion, there will be a brief Q&A and a reception upstairs in the first floor lobby. During the reception, we will also be selling copies of Andrea's recent book, Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. Again, thank you very much for coming tonight, and please silence your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Capehart and Andrea Ritchie. Thank you very much, Kai, for excuse me, your introduction and for putting all this together. Um, and you're a freshman, right? I don't. I could not have done this as a freshman. But thank you very, very much. And um, Professor Ritchie, Andrea, thank you very much for for coming to Washington and and being a part of this very important discussion. Um, we have done. We have talked about your book many times in many different venues. And when the March for Our Lives happened, and 11-year-old Naomi Wadler gave her speech. Um, I almost had to pull over the side of the road because I couldn't see it because of the tears in my eyes, because of the words coming from this 11-year-old, this 11-year-old kid. Um, and she mentioned a lot of names, and then she said, I am here today to acknowledge and represent the African-American girls whose stories don't make the front page of every national newspaper, whose stories don't lead on the evening news. I represent the African-American women who are victims of gun violence, who are simply statistics instead of vibra vibrant, beautiful girls full of potential. I instantly thought of you and thought of your book and thought of the conversations that we had uh, we had had in the past. And I think I sent you a text message asking which, you. Which brought tears to my eyes. Have you seen, have you heard her speech? Talk about, talk about Naomi Wadler and her speech and just your emotions behind that before we talk about the larger, the larger issue. I mean, I was so honored. Um, that you would think of me in that moment, especially hearing such a moving speech from such a brilliant um, young person who has asserted quite emphatically, like, why wouldn't I be woke? <laughs> like, you know, why why wouldn't eleven year olds be woke in this moment and and speaking in the way that I'm speaking, um, and and also just it it filled my. Um, heart to hear her say that in that context as well, because uh, we don't talk about black women in the context of gun violence often. Um, on my way here, I was reading about how um, almost over 90% of black women who are killed by intimate partners, or over 90% of black women who are killed are killed by intimate partners, and that 60% of that um, 
happens through gun violence, that people are, that black women are killed with guns. So when we're talking about gun violence, black women are almost never part of the conversation, even when we're talking about non-police gun violence. And then, of course, black women are targets of gun violence by police officers um, more often than, than we hear about or talk about. And so for me, her words were like a bomb in the midst of that conversation as well, as in so many other conversations that end up sort of skipping over, erasing, or invisibilizing black women's experiences. So I was so grateful for her for her words and then just deeply moved that you thought of me when you heard her. Well, the name of your, your book is Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. Why, why were you compelled to write this book with this, from a larger perspective, narrow a focus? Actually, it's not that narrow. It's quite a sprawling book. It, um, it looks at issues of racial profiling, policing, police violence, criminalization, and mass incarceration through the lens of the experiences of black women, indigenous women, women of color, immigrant women, disabled women, girls, um, trans and gender nonconforming folks. So that's actually quite a, a, a sprawling set of topics. It's just not the lens through which we usually look at those issues. Um, we usually, if we talk about policing, and there's a book that says, for instance, it's called Policing Black Men, we think, oh, that's a, a book about the broad issue of policing. But if we see a book uh, called Policing of Black Women, we think, oh, that's about a narrow take on this issue. When in fact, both are broad issues. They're just looking at them through different lenses. And so for me, it felt important, given that black women um, and women of color are the fastest growing prison and jail populations. Given that a quarter of the 10 million arrests that take place every single uh, year in this country are of women, um, that it felt really important. And given the number of women who experience um, police violence short of arrest that never make it into those numbers because they're killed before um, they make it to a jail cell, or because they're uh, strip searched, cavity searched by a side of a road, and then released without charge, um, they don't make it into the numbers. But their experiences of policing and criminalization in this country are um, essential to our understanding not just of their experiences, which are important in and of themselves, but to the understanding of the larger problem. So the Prison Policy Institute recently put out a study at the beginning of this year showing how criminal justice reform efforts since 2009 are starting to decrease the population, the men's prison population in state prisons, and that the women's prison population in state prisons is continuing to rise in the majority of states, in some places outpacing the decrease in the men's prison population. And that's because our criminal justice reform efforts have come through the lens of men's experiences. So they have um, had an impact on men's incarceration. But because we haven't looked at incarceration and criminalization and policing through the lens of women's experiences, we're not having as much of an impact there. And in fact, we're kind of losing ground in some states because of that. So that was the other reason I wanted to write it, was to make sure that when we're looking at this issue, issues of policing, profiling, criminalization, mass incarceration, we're looking at the whole picture so we can come up with solutions that address the whole problem. Um, and then finally, as kind of an ode to the activism of, of many uh, folks over the years, um, decades and decades of folks who have been clamoring about police violence against black women and women of color and indigenous women um, and not being heard and sort of getting to a point where it was like, we're just not doing that anymore. <laughs> we refuse <laughs> to be invisible anymore. And I think that's what Naomi Wadler was saying um, also at the, at the March for Our Lives is we're just, I refuse for this to be the case. And it was sort of an honor and a tribute and a resource to all the young women like her who were saying that. Mm -hmm. um, just be before I forget, and I know Kai mentioned that we'll open this up to Q&A, I just asked Kai and or Tom to flash me when it's time to, to actually go to Q&A with the audience. One of the things, Andrea, that you've said in terms of looking at the, the statistics when it comes to women of color uh, and African-American women about their interactions with police and police violence, you said, let's look, at where, let's look at where we're looking more intensely. And one of those places was stop and frisk. Talk about that. So there was quite a conversation in New York City, and I was very much a part of the movement in New York City to challenge uh, racially discriminatory use of stop and frisk by the New York City Police Department. I was one of the founding members of the kind of main coalition, Communities United for Police Reform, um, that was uh, that fought that practice as part of a larger sort of practice of broken windows policing um, in New York City. And that conversation was frequently about how black and brown men were the primary targets. 88% of people stopped were black and brown. Um, and 
so people were talking about this as a practice that targeted um, young black and brown men. And one of the things I was able to ascertain by with my very rudimentary statistical analysis skills and math skills and with some help is that the rates of racial disparity in the stops of women were identical to those in the stops of men. But we weren't talking about that. And we weren't talking about the unique forms um, of violence and degradation that were happening to women, black women, women of color, in the context of stop and frisk either. Um, sexual assault and harassment during stop and frisk in New York City is so prevalent that young women call it stop and grope. Um, yet that wasn't part of the, the conversation. There was one New York Times article written, written by Wendy Ruderman, who's now in Philadelphia at the Inquirer, talking about women's unique experiences of stop and frisk. But um, that wasn't part of the larger conversation. So I think that's one example of where if we look more closely um, where we're already looking, we'll see the experiences of black women. And we'll see both similar experiences um, and unique experiences that tell us more about the scope of the entire problem. And you, the book is, when you flip through it, because there are um, names, statistics, stories, and the overall theme is that the lives of black women are criminalized in any number of ways. And so one is um, you know, charges of prostitution for simply just being a black woman or a woman of color in some place they're not supposed to be. Talk more about that. Or in their own neighborhood where right, they are yeah. supposed to be, right? Right. Um, well, that's why I said perceived to be in some <laughs> right. place where they're not supposed to be. Um, I mean, I think that one thing that the last 30 days has taught us is that, the, that we're in a crisis of criminalization. Um, and that the primary response to black presence in public spaces is to call the police, right? Um, and that that happens um, in a Waffle House, that happens outside an Airbnb, that happens when black women are golfing, that happens when someone's moving in to an apartment in Harlem, it happens in a bunch of places. Do you places. know all these stories? I, I had the Airbnb one, I hadn't heard that one. Uh, the golf one, we've heard about the golf one, yeah. And I think that, so we're, we're talking about those things now, and, and we'll continue to talk about them, but we don't talk about how the same thing happens when black women or women of color are out at night in a neighborhood. Um, and this happens in DC. It happens, in fact, very close to this location, where black women and women of color who are out on the streets um, late at night are assumed, or sometimes during the day, are assumed to be engaged in prostitution no matter what they're doing. And that's particularly true for black trans women, but also for black non-trans women. Um, and that's based on stereotypes really rooted in slavery, that you know, black women as an identity equals prostitution as an activity that was developed to justify um, the systematic and structural and rampant and genocidal rape of black women during slavery was to sort of say, this is these folks are sexually deviant anyway. And so that's translated into um, the ways in which police and members of the public perceive black women's presence in public spaces. And so um, in New York City, 84% of people who are arrested for loitering for the purposes of prostitution are black and Latina. That's the same rate of racial disparity as we were just talking about in Stop and Frisk. One made national headlines, was the sort of subject of a citywide movement. The other one hasn't. I would argue that both should be, right? Because right. Um, similarly, we talk about black women's presence in, in all the situations we just talked about, people are up in arms. I don't see us being as much up in arms at the fact that you know, at any given night, a black woman could be standing on a street corner in DC and be profiled as being engaged in a prostitution based on what she's wearing, what she looks like, or simply who she is. Um, one of the, there's stop and frisk, but there's also the so-called war on drugs. That pulls in that pulls in um, women of color into the the criminal justice system and also you know make victims of police violence. You wrote an op-ed for the New York Times last July. You did not write the headline. I did not. But the headline is an attention grabber um, because the headline is a warrant to search your vagina. What's the story here? That's the story of how the war on drugs is waged on the bodies of black women. And then the reason I give the caveat about the headline is and trans and gender nonconforming people. So um, people have all kinds of body cavities searched during, uh, in the context of the war on drugs, including vaginas. And um, the story behind 
uh, that was of a young woman named Sharnesia Corley who um, failed to stop at a stop sign allegedly, which I would argue even if she did, most of us have done at some point in our lives, maybe on our way here. Um, and in her case, the officer who pulled her over claimed he smelled marijuana in her car and proceeded to call a female officer to the scene to conduct a search of her. And when the female officer arrived on the scene, um, I'm just gonna give a trigger warning that I'm talking about sexualized violence now. Um, the officer forced her pants down, forced her down to the ground, forced her legs apart and threatened to break them, and then forcibly conducted a search of her vagina for 11 minutes, according to the dash cam video, by the side of the road at a gas station in Houston in full public view. And that she described as a sexual assault, as a rape. Um, she experienced it that way. That certainly by law is what it was because that is constitutionally completely impermissible. Yet that kind of search happens on an alarmingly regular basis and is in many ways the way that the war on drugs is waged on the bodies of black women, whether it's at the airport, on highways, on roadways, or in women's homes. And um, the requirement that you, the, the constitutional requirement is that you need probable cause to do that, and that you therefore need a warrant, and that says your search should be conducted in private by a medical professional. That doesn't mean that doesn't happen. In fact, there were congressional hearings in the early 90s about how, under the supervision of medical professionals, women who were landing at airports across the country were being forced to be subjected to those kinds of searches, and also forced to take laxatives and subject to monitored bowel movements. So this perception of black women's bodies as vessels for drugs you know, concealed or consumed or somehow conveyed is something that leads to the invasion of black women's bodies in very public ways, in very degrading ways, and in very invasive ways on a regular basis in the context of the war on drugs. And that's one of the examples of the kinds of policing and criminalization that we wouldn't see in the numbers of mass incarceration. So yes, it's true that the war on drugs is a primary driver of mass incarceration of women of color, that that's gonna be the case under the current administration even more under the tactics that they're ramping up. And it's also true that many, in many cases, women like Sharnesia Corley don't make it to a jail cell because there was no drugs to be found, no charges, the charges were dropped, um, but that's a violation she's gonna live with for the rest of her life that needs to also be part of our accounting of the harms of the war on drugs. And I seem to, to re uh, recall that there was also another while black um, situation, and that was giving birth while black. Which is another um, aspect of the war on drugs, but also um, of just sort of denial of black women's bodily autonomy and women of color's bodily autonomy that happens in a context where we don't often look. So up to 10, black women are up to 10 times more likely to be tested for drugs during prenatal visits and uh, delivery than white women, despite the fact that there's equal rates of drug use across race um, among pregnant people. And again, that's a, that's a pretty high rate of racial disparity. It's higher than the rate of racial disparities in arrests in this country, but it's not one that we're talking about in the same ways. Um, because it's happening in private, because it's happening to women who maybe you know we have feelings about or judgments about. Um, but that um, leads not only to um, referral maybe to law enforcement for child abuse and neglect, but actually can lead to arrest in the delivery room immediately after giving birth um, under charges of delivering drugs to a minor, for instance, or endangering a child. And as opposed to support treatment and things that would keep a child and a mother together, which everyone knows are, is the most healthy approach, uh, generally speaking. Um, and then, you know, it's often about drugs, but it's not always about drugs. There are studies that show that black women's decisions during pregnancy, whether it's to have a C-section, whether it's to continue to have sex past the point somebody thinks some, they should, whether it's to eat in certain things or have a home birth or whatever, are very much more scrutinized and result in profiling and criminalization and punishment um, and arrest uh, way more often um, than for non-black women or non-women of color. Now, the name that, um sort of like leapt to the forefront in terms of paying attention to what was happening, not just to African-American men, but to African-American women at the hands of law enforcement was Sandra Bland. And the fact that we could see what was happening because of that dash cam video, how simply trying to get out of the way of a police officer and not putting on her traffic, her signal light, she goes from, from that to being found dead in her cell 
three days later because this happened on a Friday and she had to stay in jail over the weekend. You were telling me um, in the back there that there is a new documentary out about what happened to Sandra Bland. Um, did it shed? Did it shed any new light for you, given your your research and your writing? Did it shed any new light for you on that case? I mean, it's called um, "Say Her Name: The Life and Death of Sandra Bland." It'll be on HBO this fall. I debuted at Tribeca a few weeks ago. I'm still wrecked by it. It was really hard to watch um, because what it reinforced for me was that one encounter with a law enforcement agent can literally change the entire course of your life and death. And that in that Sandra Bland's death was completely avoidable, preventable, um, and came entirely because a white man um, decided to punish her for asking a question or asserting her dignity. And if you watch the death cam video, it's very clear. She says very calmly, why do I have to put my, own, my cigarette out? I'm in my own car. She's not yelling, she's not screaming, she's not threatening anyone, she's not doing anything. She's, and she's answering his question. He said, you, you seem irritated. So she feels like it's probably best if she answers the question rather than ignoring him, because he's a, an officer with a gun. So I think that the whole way in which black women's existence and responses are policed in public spaces and by public law enforcement officers that's been the subject of so much conversation is what killed Sandra Bland. And so for me, that was what um, just the film really drove home. And then the way in which um, bail and pretrial detention are, are basically deadly is what drove home, it drove home for me. And if I, you know, there's a um, Black Mama's bailout happening in um, uh, this weekend for Mother's Day. Um, groups in the movement for black lives around the country, including here in the uh, DMV area, are raising money to bail out black women um, in time for Mother's Day. And they're doing it so they can be home with their children because 80% of women who are incarcerated in jails are mothers, often of minor children, often they're the sole caregiver, often they're there for very minor offenses. They want to bail black mamas out to give them a chance to keep their children, not lose them to child protective services, um, and also give them a better chance to fight their case so they can stay home with their families. But also, when I walked out of the Sandra Bland film, if I had a million dollars, I would have given it to bail out every woman who was in a cell whose mental health is being neglected, who's experiencing physical violence, the after effects of physical violence, and possibly murder at the hands of um, her jailers. Um, and I, so for me, that was the other thing that I really walked away with that was urgent. Um, I also walked away with a strong sense of the love and resilience of Sandra's family, of her mother and her sisters and how hard they fought for justice in her case and how firmly they believe um, that they will continue, need to continue to fight in her name. Um, and so I think it was also a story of resilience and resistance on the part of black women, which has always been the case. I think that often um, some of the takes that have been out there recently about um, Shakisha Clements and the Waffle House incident sort of say, Things like, why is no one standing up for black women? You know, why aren't we out there for black women? And I, I think they're speaking to a disproportionate response that requires an answer, right? Um, because, uh, because we've definitely heard more about some cases than others. But what, I, what is true also is that black women have been standing for black women for a very long time. And I hope that Invisible No More really kind of lifts that reality up and pays tribute to the longstanding resistance of people like Sandra Bland's family and the people who have organized around her case who have never stopped um, fighting for black women who experience police violence and incarceration and criminalization. So if anyone does anything before you leave tonight, please pull out your phones, go to nomoremoneybail.org and make a donation, I don't care how much, to bail someone out so they don't become the next Sandra Bland. If that's the one thing people can do on the live stream in here, I really <laughs> uh, would implore you to do that and then to see the film in the fall. So during the Obama administration, I think a lot of people took it for granted that when things happened, such as Ferguson, that there was this just assumption that the Justice Department is going to step in and they're going to go down and they're going to investigate because that's what the Justice Department is supposed to do. And as we've learned, with a change of administration comes a change in priorities. Um, and what we're seeing with the Trump administration is a complete change in priorities. 
I'm sure a lot of people either watching a live stream or sitting here now listening to the conversation and hearing sort of reliving and revisiting Sandra Bland and all the other cases and learning for the first time some of the, the cases that you just talked about is probably wondering, so what can we do about it? And what can we do about it with a Department of Justice and a White House that is opposed to what the previous administ administration did? I mean, I think the first thing we have to do here in DC is harm reduction, right? Um, and blocking what we can. So um, this week, the what is now called the Protect and Serve Act, um, which uh, before was called the Thin Blue Line or the Back the Blue Act, which is basically legislation that would use federal law to make it a hate crime to um, harm anyone who is or is perceived to be a law enforcement officer and impose mandatory minimums up to the death penalty is now in front of Congress or will be in front of Congress. And the, the, the phrasing that leaps out at me is perceived to be a law enforcement officer, which means like you would loop in, and I'm going to say it because I'm an opinion writer, lunatics <laughs> like George Zimmerman who killed Trayvon Martin. But also probation officers, parole officers, people who exercise a great deal of control over people's lives, right? And then the catch with these bills is that they reach any federally funded law enforcement officer. And okay. pretty much every law enforcement officer in this country is federally funded because most receive grants from the Department of Justice. So it wouldn't, so I, just so I want to make sure I'm telling the truth in this age of not telling the truth, it seems, that because George Zimmerman was a so-called neighborhood watch person, he would not fall under that. But hey, who, who knows? knows? Because these laws are written so broadly and with such an intention to sweep up anyone. So I just want to say that in this context, Sandra Bland would have been charged with a hate crime because she was charged with assaulting a police officer. And that was what was keeping her in jail that weekend. Chakesia Clemens, who's been charged with resisting arrest, could be charged with a hate crime. Do you see where this is going? I mean, really, like charges of resisting arrest and assault on a police officer are almost de rigueur in any situation where an officer is using excessive force. It's the cover charge. You know, police misconduct attorneys across the country, de criminal defense attorneys across the country will tell you there's a, a triumvirate, right? It's like disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, assault on a police officer that you charge someone with if you have done something wrong. If they hadn't killed Oscar Grant, they would have charged him with those things, even though, you know, he did nothing. So I think. Um, to think about the reach of this, right? That people, mm -hmm. when they talk about this kind of bill, are going to be like, oh, this is for the Dallas shooter. But actually, it would sweep in people like the people we've been talking about. Um, so people on the Hill need to block that bill for so many reasons, right? I mean, a law enforcement is a profession. It's not an identity. It's not immutable. It's not what these this pieces of legislation were for, whether you agree these with them the, or not. And, and these are the same folks who railed against hate crime right. legislation, like the the... James Byrd and um, Matthew Shepard and, Math and the Matthew Shepard right. Act and this did not very, want that to happen. But now they want to add law enforcement officers into that act. Now, there are many um, uh, professions that are much more dangerous. Um, you know, the people who were killed by law enforcement is a, a number that is a, an order or tenfold larger than the number of law enforcement officers who die in the line of duty. Um, minors die, you know, more frequently. There's many other sort of um, professions that are more dangerous. And so, um, but it, regardless, I think that the, the intent of these bills is to criminalize and, and increase penalties against people who police are already targeting and already charging with assault on police officers or um, uh, resisting arrest on an alarming basis. So block those things at the federal level. Um, I don't think there's much to be done with the Department of Justice or the White House in terms of regulating local and state law enforcement agencies. I think at this point, people are calling in their state attorney generals to do the job. Um, people are just, are you know, continuing to fight at the local level as they have been um, with is law the, enforcement agencies. Is there a level of trust at the state at, state attorney's level, uh, a not level of trust? Not necessarily. <laughs> well, <laughs> more so than with the federal uh, attorney general? Or has there always been distrust and nothing, the, the, there's no? I don't, I don't know that I would compare. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to say, right? Some state attorney general are, are very similar to the current federal attorney general. Right. Others are different. I think it's hard to generalize across states. But I think people are, are trying to figure out, as a general rule, what they can do at the local and state level to, um, to reduce police violence, to increase accountability for police violence. And I think more and more, we are seeing people move um, forward these sort of invest-divest campaigns, these campaigns that actually say, actually, what if we focused on what made us safer? Mm 
instead of continuing to invest in more and more criminalization, such that the police are the response to everything, including, you know, you see a group of black women checking out of an Airbnb, they don't wave to you, you call the police, right? What if we do something and then suddenly they're surrounded by seven cop cars and a chopper, right? And fearing for their lives. What if we came up with other <laughs> responses, such as maybe having a conversation with someone, right? Or right. minding your own business, any number of things, right? But then um, if we think of other areas where criminalization has invaded, like responses to mental health crises, responses to poverty, responses to youth whose schools have closed, for whom there's no after school services, for whom there's no employment, for whom you know there's a number of social conditions. I think for most people at this point that um, uh, I'm in conversation with, people are really thinking about how to shrink the role of the police and reduce the number of police interactions altogether as the thing that is the sh most surefire way of making sure that we don't have um, encounters like the ones we've been talking about. You know, in, in sort of the guiding questions that, that Kai presented us to sort of help, help us think about how to talk about this today, there's a really a terrific question in here. I'm just gonna ask it of you directly. Um, the United States has grown to be relatively insensitive to guns, I, yes. But in your opinion, are police shootings a gun violence issue, a police training issue, or a racism discrimination issue, or are they all intertwined? All of the above. But police shootings are definitely a gun violence issue. Um, if, I mean, I think the argument with gun violence issues generally is if we didn't have access to guns, there wouldn't be so many shootings. If police officers didn't have guns, there wouldn't be so many shootings. And I'll give um, the example, for instance, of uh, DeCynthia Clements, who, I mean, in the month of March, you probably heard about three, well, three people were killed by the police. You probably heard about Stefan Clark killed in his uh, grandmother's backyard um, by police officers looking for someone, again, who someone had called the police alleging vandalism had taken place and suddenly this man is dead as and a result. And he had a cell phone. Exactly. Um, you might have heard of Sahid Vassell who was in his neighborhood in Brooklyn where everyone sort of knew him and his particular relationship to, you know, the world and maybe that occasionally he experienced alternative realities and um, but people knew how to interact with him um, but people who were new to the neighborhood called the police um, which led to his death but you probably didn't hear of DeCynthia Clements who was a black woman who was in a crisis of some kind um, was killed by a police officer as she was stepping out of a burning car gasping for air and that's an instance where I am convinced if the officer did not have a gun, she wouldn't be dead, right? Um, he, in the moments before he shot her, was talking about the need to, you know, if there's a problem, we need to help her. If there's a problem of some kind, well, we might use a taser or some other non-lethal weapon, but, you know, we're, we're, we're here to help her. And within seconds of her stepping out of the car, gasping for air, which he characterized as grunting, which is why I feel like training is not necessarily the answer because it's literally about perceptions of black women that are very intractable, um, that despite all of his training about how to respond to people in crisis, immediately took over as soon as she stepped out of the car and he shot her. I, I, that's a case of, of a death that wouldn't have occurred if a gun hadn't been on the scene. And that's, to me, the definition of gun violence, right? Um, also, um, yeah, so I, I feel like we have, I mean, there's been a lot of conversation. I don't want to repeat what other people um, far more versed in this have said, but you know, black youth have been um, marching and fighting and struggling around gun violence um, for years now. Gun violence perpetrated by George Zimmerman, gun violence perpetrated by um, people who kill women who show up at their door when their car breaks down. And looking for help. Yeah. Exactly. So people have been talking about that kind of gun violence for a very long time. That is very much part of the larger conversation, gun violence. Um, and then, you know, is it a question of, of just using different approaches to the issues, you know, of just having different responses to people in mental health crisis? I think that would, um, based on estimates that at least half of people who are killed by police are or are perceived to be in a mental health crisis at the time, would cut the number of police shootings in at least half if we came up with a different response to people in mental health crisis. So that's a gun violence issue we could work on, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's many ways to frame the issue um, in such a way that we start to see this as part of a larger problem of um, particularly violent responses to black and brown folks in public spaces and homes. Can we go back to DeCynthia? Yes. I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around the fact that the police arrive, the car's on fire, they know they're talking about how we're, we're going we're going to help her. She gets out gasping for air, and they shoot her. 
they had been um, in they had known about her for a while. They had first encountered her elsewhere. Um, she had driven off. They didn't follow her to their credit. They didn't engage in a car chase, which is one of the more deadly ways that police mm -hmm. officers engage people as well. So to their credit, they didn't do that. They then later came across her by the side of the road, um, went up to talk to her. One officer says he saw something that he thought might be a knife. They backed off um, and began talking to her, but they didn't never call mental health professionals to the scene. They didn't call a crisis response team to the scene. They didn't do any of the things that they were supposedly trained to do. And at some point in the course of this, they're telling her it's really time for her to come out of the car. And she, the, a fire breaks out in the car. I, you know, who knows how it happened. Right. Um, and so she's coming out of the car. And she's opening her passenger door. And the police are coming up behind. She steps out of the car and goes in the only direction you can go when you're opening a car door, which is towards the back of the car. And she's trying to move away from the smoke and the fire. And the, the officers claim that, you know, and literally she didn't take two steps before they shot her. Um, but the officer claimed, the officers supposedly claimed that they were in fear for their lives. Right. And, and I ask, the, I, and I ask the, the question because my mind immediately goes to discretion. I thought at Police Academy, police officers are trained not to escalate, not to go to the most... Um, um, lethal form of, of handling a situation, they're supposed to de-escalate and come to a peaceful conclusion. Maybe that's just my utopian view of the way police officers are trained, but why are we always talking about police officers going the most lethal route instead of... I, using a taser, talking to a person, as you said, calling mental health professionals, calling in other people to ensure that everyone in, the, in that situation at that time leaves with their own live, lives. I mean, if there's anything the last 30 days or the last 500 years have taught us is there's different right. rules for black people, right? And that, um, that even if that, I think what was most painful about this incident was that clearly the officers had been trained to do something very different and were talking about doing something very different up until the moment they came face to face with this woman. And to me, that's when these controlling narratives of black women um, take over and they're narratives that are really pervasive, right? We've talked about the study that came out of St. Louis that found that um, black women are the uh, demographic group that is most likely to be shot by police when unarmed. Over 60% of black women who are shot by police are shot when they're unarmed. So they are falsely perceived to be a threat more often than any other group. That's based on stereotypes of black women that came straight from slavery as animalistic, as threatening, as inherently deranged, as um, violent, as likely to assault you. And those are the things that um, you know, and as sexually promiscuous and as um, sexually deviant and as overly masculine. I mean, all those things are the things that literally cloud officers' visions when they interact with black women in such a way that um, whatever training or whatever discretion gets exercised in this way. I'm not saying this is unique to black women. I think that it's very clearly something that, that affects black men, men of color, women of color, um, indigenous women, indigenous men. What I'm saying is that for each of them, there are different sort of logics and stereotypes and histories, but very similar reactions. And so I think... Um, there's just so much on the internet, right? Of like this person, there was a recently a meme of a white woman like getting up in an officer's face and screaming and yelling and gesticulating right. and by the side of the road and she's still alive, right? I mean, I just, I feel like those kinds of comparisons could be made ad nauseum and just really illustrate that police training um, <laughs> is, is not the issue here. The issue mm -hmm. is the perceptions of black and brown bodies and lives, the value that's placed on black and brown bodies and lives, the, the way in which, we, as we've been talking about, the, the primary response to the presence of black bodies in public spaces is to call the police. That should tell us everything we need to know about not just what's informing police interactions, but also kind of what's driving the police and what we really need to shift. In Montgomery, uh, I guess now, Two weeks ago this week, the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice opened in Montgomery. And both of those places, within a 10-minute walk of each other, are very intentional in making sure that people understand, to everything that you were just saying, that slavery led to lynchings, led to Jim Crow segregation, led to mass incarceration, and 
the thing that unites all of them is this view of black people as dangerous, uh, inferior, and need to be controlled. And so if any of you ever have an opportunity to go to Montgomery, uh, please go and go to those two places. They, they truly are uh, spectacular institutions and sort of crystallize, really, I think, everything that you're talking about, everything that's in your, that's in your book. Your book is a, just a microcosm of everything of the last 500 years uh, of our history. Um, I know, Kai, you said we had 10 minutes. I'm going to go to Q&A, go to Q&A now. Um, I just ask that you, two things, please. Questions, short, short questions, and please no speeches. And if you start speechifying, I will have to interrupt you. I don't mean to be rude, but I'll, I'll be rude doing it. Uh, so just identify yourself and, again, questions. I'll start with you up here, and then I'll see you. Okay, so Hold on. Well, oh, that was the other thing. Wait for the mic. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. OK. Oh, that's impressive. <laughs> um, my question is, if you wouldn't mind repeating so that I can write down the information you were talking about with the um, getting the moms out of jail. like how okay. to help with that or donate to that, if you could just repeat it for me. Okay. Yes, Thank the you. website is nomoremoneybail.org. Um, so yes, please, just make any donation you can. Mother's Day is next Sunday. Let's free as many black women as we can. Last year, we freed 100 black women. Um, I know people are aiming to do a lot more. Or 100 black moms. And also that we're including in that category trans and gender nonconforming people and people who serve as moms to their community, right? Play moms, moms who, who take care of everyone around them, who help young trans folks coming up, everyone who sort of plays that role in the community. Thanks. Question here. Yes. Um, my question is, um, have you had an opportunity to uh, connect with people who didn't agree with your perspective? And can you? <laughs> include that in a book because there's always two sides to every story no matter what the issue is. So I would ask you if you would include some perspectives that were unique or different or completely adverse to your own that maybe the book would be more interesting, at least for me, that you went into that uh, aspect. Thank you for your question. I, what would that well, look like? For one, I think the 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 different views whether the views are that you know black women's experiences of policing are not significant enough or that there's not enough numbers or that you know it's, if we make the gold standard of police violence shootings of unarmed people that black women don't register enough in the numbers to, for that to be um, part of the story as opposed to looking at say the full spectrum of police violence if you include police sexual violence black women suddenly become a very large proportion of people experiencing police misconduct um, so I think that there's there's already a lot of op like the dominant conversation is already reflecting those views. So in some ways, um, the book is a response to the opposing views that are out there in the world or the views that would um, uh, ignore what's in the book. And I describe a number of campaigns in the book that I've been involved in or organizing efforts or litigation efforts that I've been involved in where I describe the views of my opponents, right? Um, and including people who sometimes are on the same side, um, but we had different views of how to proceed. So there are different views in there. Um, and then I think that, um, there's a value to um, offering a particular lens through which to look through issues. Um, and I think there's been a dominant one, and this is an, an alternative um, complementary one. It's not a competition one. It's a complementary one. It's something to complete the conversation or to start to complete the conversation. Thanks for your question. Um, purple, Tom, right there. Sorry to be overly descriptive. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I've always read after all these cases happen that they say actually statistically many more white people are shot by the police than black people, which would make sense. There's more white people in this country. But also you have, you're talking about um, police targeting women. I would, I would like to hear your opinion. There was a case, I think it happened in December. It might have been a little earlier in Minnesota. It was a woman who had come here. She was engaged from Australia and was shot by, um, I'm not sure if he was born here or if he was an immigrant from Somali. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, she had called reporting what she thought was a rape going on outside of her home. It looked like it was a nice neighborhood. It was a very strange story. And he actually shot, shot her while she, while she was talking to his partner, who was in the car. It, it, and it just disappeared from the media, just completely gone. Have you had any opinion on that? I don't know that it disappeared from media. In fact, I think there was universal outrage, and the police chief immediately resigned, and the officer was immediately fired and prosecuted. Um, and I think that, that there was no accident there because the woman was white. And she was also an immigrant. She also was not born in this country, right? She was <laughs> uh, Austra uh, Australian yeah. or South Africa? Yeah. Australian. Yeah, so I think yeah. there's an interesting juxtaposition how we describe both characters in that, right? Um, and he was black and Somali and Muslim. And that's, that's the people we're already demonizing and criminalizing in this country. And so it was a very easy uh, thing for the media to then demonize him and his mistake and have him face the full consequences and accountability and to lift her up as the idealized victim in ways that, say, that um, certainly Corinne Gaines was not lifted up as an idealized victim. Certainly, um, DeCynthia Clements is not being lifted up as an idealized victim. And you know both were women who were in distress and, and needed help too, right? So I think. Um, I think, and I could list many, many more. So for me, of course, I, it's a tragedy that she was shot. I, I, I'm very um, you know, outraged that someone would be shot in that kind of situation. I think it's an example of gun violence. I think it's an example of when we have guns, people die. <laughs> um, and I'm mindful of the racial dynamics of the response, um, both in terms of the public outrage, uh, the consequences for everyone involved, and how quickly um, people, including the law enforcement community, who normally will stand up for any shoot as a good shoot, were to demonize the person because of who he was. I believe the gentleman there in the pink shirt had a question. And then I see someone, All right? OK, you'll be next, and then you'll be next. Jonathan, you referred to um, the principle that police are trained to de-escalate the situation as much as possible. I thought they were. I thought they were, OK. and then. I have understood that police in many municipalities are trained to shoot to kill. What would be the ideal training for a police officer in, in situations? What, what would you foresee to be the best way to teach police officers to certainly protect themselves, but to end up not killing so many people? I don't know that there's a, thank you for the question. I just, I wish I had an answer, right? But I. I just have seen so many situations, you know, I could list names. Michelle Cousseau is a black lesbian woman who was killed by an officer who was trained in crisis intervention during a mental health call, right? DeCynthia Clements was killed by officers who were trained in de-escalation. You know, the Elgin Police Department is supposedly one of the better community policing departments in the country. Wyatt Senek actually just did a, a great show on uh, Elgin and his new um, series called Problem Areas on HBO, um, talking about exactly this, that here were officers who were trained using the best training standards and still, um, you know, our, our people, black folks in the community are experiencing them differently. So I think for me, I, I think training without accountability does nothing. I think training without um, leadership and supervision and discipline does nothing. And I have, I continue to believe that reducing police contact is the best way to reduce police violence, particularly for black and brown folks. And so for me, that's where I put my energies. And investing in the things communities need. Um, Chicago right now is in the middle of a fight where um, 50 schools have been closed, seven mental health clinics have been closed, and the mayor wants to build a $95 million new police training academy. People in that neighborhood are like, actually, we have lots of other ideas of how you could spend $95 million that would actually keep us safer, actually allow us to not just survive, but thrive. Um, that would involve education, mental health care, um, investment, job, employment opportunities, et cetera. And we actually feel like those are the things that would make us more safe than a $95 million police training academy. So I feel like I'm leaning more in that direction because I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I've seen so many instances where police officers who were trained with the best available training have. Um, still done some of the things we've talked about. Question back there, the purple shirt. Hi, due to how policing was constructed through slavery, do you think over-policing should be looked at as a public health issue? 
I think policing should be looked at as a public health issue. I tend not to use the term over policing because I just I feel like we might not all agree on what a, a right amount of policing is. Um, and but what I do think we all agree on is safety and that we all want to be safe um, and and whole and have access to the things we need. Um, and so I think a, policing is a police violence is a public health issue because people are not just. Uh, killed by it in you know uh, significant proportions, but they're also um, often injured by it. There's a lot of people who experience um, temporary and permanent disabilities due to interactions with police officers that we often don't talk about. Um, and then the level of stress um, that comes from living in a, in a neighborhood that's heavily policed has been documented by many um, public health professionals, right? And the ways that that leads to premature death for black women particularly. There was one researcher I was on a panel with recently at University of Michigan who talked about black women in highly policed neighborhoods um, having very high levels of high blood pressure, of um, sort of stress-related health conditions, and dying at younger ages as a result. Um, I think that's true for everyone in communities that are heavily policed, not just black women, um, but particularly falls on black women. And I think um, there's so many other ways that we, it's a public health issue because policing gets in the way of public health. For a long time in the District of Columbia, and I think it's still true, police officers would use the presence or possession of condoms as evidence of intent to engage in prostitution. It was so prevalent that the Metropolitan Police Department had to make a little card that they would hand out to people saying, actually, we don't do this anymore. <laughs> because people were, thought there was a number, a legal number of condoms that you could carry um, above which you would be arrested. Um, and in fact, I've seen police officers use as few as one condom as evidence of intent to engage in prostitution. That's part of how this racial profiling we were talking about earlier happens. That's getting in the way of public health very directly, right? Police officers hanging out outside syringe exchange facilities or <laughs> facilities where people are going to get methadone and arresting people is a public health problem. I could go on and on. So there's many ways that it's a public health issue. And I think many of the issues that we respond to now with policing and criminalization are in fact public health issues and that we should invest in public health based responses, keeping in mind that the medical industrial complex has also not been kind to black and brown people and disabled people, right? So when I hear people like the occupant of the, or the person who's occupying the White House at this moment in the response to the shooting in Florida say, we need to reinstitutionalize everyone with mental health issues, um, you know, that's not a public health response to people in mental health crisis. That's a carceral, punitive, uh, torturing response. And so I think we have to be careful about the alternative response that we come up with. I've heard people say, um, you know, who have been criminalized around mental health issues, you know, it's hard sometimes to tell the difference between the Hal doll and the handcuffs. And I've heard young women say, I can't sometimes tell when I'm taken to the jail or the mental health facility. I think the sheets are a little bit softer in one place or the bed's a little bit thicker. So I think we need to be careful not to substitute um, similar responses from different institutions. Um, green shirt, the beard here. Yeah. Great. What were the other hands that I just saw? Wow, there's wow. a lot. Okay, I see you. I see you. Okay, I'm looking at the future a little bit, and um, when I focus on it, I worry about the following thing. What do you think will happen in about 10, 12 years after whites will no longer be the majority of the country? And, uh, and therefore, if I'm not mistaken, the police, which is you know, relatively speaking disproportionately white, that will basically you know, fade away, if you will, and Hispanics dominate demographically the blacks around the country. And, and you, know, you know the old saying, of course, demographics is destiny. That's a great question. What happens in 2044? Yeah, but yeah. I think we're unfortunately already seeing what happens in 2044, which is um, a, a, a effort um, to retain white supremacy by any means necessary. Um, and, um, and I think you know studies have shown that, um, that I mean, I, there's one study particularly that I just learned with my students that um, black police officers are more likely to commit violence against black folks. Um, for a variety of reasons. Can one, you talk, talk, yeah, talk I mean, about those reasons. I mean, one is that black police officers, and that's obviously a, a, a study, one study, and not a gross generalization, but one reason is because black police officers tend to be stationed in primarily black neighborhoods, so they're kind of um, limited in where they are allowed to police mm. um, and who they're allowed to police um, in ways that are, again, sort of rooted in historical uh, narratives. And then also I think that there's a police culture where you have to prove yourself and you have to prove that you're not going to, you know, um, favor people from your own community. Um, and then there might be some other aspects of sort of 
internal community policing that are happening. Um, so for instance, I remember hearing um, about some black women police officers on the west side who were particularly brutal to black women who were involved in the sex trade on the west side of Chicago and would like hit them, make them take their shoes off, walk home in the snow with no shoes on. It was something about policing that group of women and what they were doing that was, I don't know, some kind of politics of respectability, punishment, something. Power. Yeah, That's exactly. That's a word you, did yes. not, you have not yes. used, but exactly. there's a power dynamic Absolutely. going on. Absolutely, in, within our own communities as well. So I think that for me, I don't, you know, I've represented enough people who have been uh, represented uh, two young uh, lesbians of color who were beaten by a black cop who, you know, called them dyke-ass bitches while he was beating them. I just, to me, in that moment, I'm not... It's a different person doing the beating than we expect. It's different subjects than we expect. And the words are different. But to me, it is the same exercise of power along different lines. So um, I don't know that the changing demographics of the police force is going to change anything. The young woman with the glasses with her hand raised in the white top. No, no, no. Up, 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 up. <laughs> No, no, no. We'll come back to you, but you have, you've had your hand up for a long time. I'm trying to get to everybody. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Mine's quick. I just wanted you to repeat the piece of legislation that you said that was important to block. Um, I think it's called Protect and Serve Act now. And it used to be called Black, Black, Back the Blue, and then before that it was called Blue Lives Matter. But basically any legislation that enhances penalties for any actual or perceived harm against actual or perceived law enforcement officers... It's not like those things aren't offenses everywhere. I mean, Sandra Bland was in jail on an assault on a police officer charge, right? The question is, should it have been something that carried an even more higher penalty and possibly the death penalty, right? And named a hate crime. Okay, who is the one who had the <laughs> microphone snatched from them? I'm sorry about that. Oh, you got it? Okay. Thanks. Um, I just have a quick one. Um, I was sitting in a park on Capitol Hill yesterday, and a police officer came up to me and I, I, was, I was reading and was like, hi, I just have a question for you. And he asked, have you seen a suspicious person in the area? My first question is, is this something that happens all the time? And second, as someone who has like, the privilege to be able to have a, maybe have a constructive conversation with this officer, like, what should I have said? I just said, no, like, what? But <laughs> I think that's a good answer. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, if it continued, I might have said something like, am I free to go? And then I would have walked away slowly facing them so they didn't think I was going for anything. Um, I just think you don't have to talk to police officers if you don't want to. And most people don't know that. And also, it's very intimidating when someone has a weapon and they're staying there. And depending on you know, your privilege, that might not actually be an option, right? And so right. I think, but I think particularly people with light skin privilege, white privilege, um, these questions about suspicious characters just know that they will lead to black people and brown people. Right. And just, I think that people are really emphasizing for white folks, if they didn't know before, that you know, you call the police on someone like Saheed Vassell and he could wind up dead. Um, you know, you call the police on, on any black person, it could lead to death or bodily injury or changing the entire course of someone's life, right? So I think the, the, the real takeaway is like, don't do it, stop, stop calling the police, don't engage them on their suspicious, what, who's suspicious, who's not, just be like, done. Right, but with a question that's so ripe for like implicit bias, what could I, is there a conversation that I can start with that officer or more broadly that I should be partaking in better? Like, cause I, he, he came up to me and was super, because of like who I am, he was super friendly and was like, hey, I'm just sitting there reading. Like, and then he walks away like super kind. Like, should I have engaged him? Or I'm just, a criminal defense lawyer. I'm like, you're like <laughs> keep the conversation <laughs> short and quick. And that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, OK, question here. Thank you. Wonderful response to that. Um, can you discuss the role of police unions in protecting, supporting, and reinstating officers who have been fired for police mis misconduct? And that's a major role, but I'd like to hear what, you, what your research has shown. That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, police uh, unions um, are very effective at bringing things to arbitration, even if people have you know, been terminated, and then ultimately many officers are reinstated as a result, or that discipline that was more harsh is reduced in a vast number of cases. I want to talk about um, the fact that police unions in Illinois actively lobbied against legislation that would have created civilian oversight over cases of police sexual misconduct. 
So to me, that says, like, they really are not interested in accountability for anything, including things that most law enforcement officers would say, and I've heard them say, shame the badge, and shame them, and that they don't agree with at all. Yet, um, the notion that you must protect police officers at all costs is what drives the unions um, to the point of not being willing to even look at sexual misconduct by their members. So that, uh, and they play tremendous roles in ensuring continued investment in policing and criminalization as a response to things as opposed to the kinds of things that might make us safer. Um, they're just, the, they play a huge role. And I want to lift up places like Austin, Texas, that have recently like pushed back and said, no, we're not signing a contract that takes away our power to hold officers accountable for the things they do um, that harm people. It, remind me if I'm wrong, it, wasn't it during the, um, the investigation into the Baltimore Police Department as a result of Freddie Gray, the, the death of Freddie Gray, that they discovered this, was it Baltimore? This vast um, um, I, I can't, uh, scandal of sexual assault and sexual abuse by police officers of women. Yeah, and it was uncovered thanks to the work of a group in Baltimore called Power Inside, who, rep who works with black women, women of color, who uh, live on the streets of Baltimore or are involved in street economies or are profiled as if they are. And they brought the testimony to the DOJ to say, listen, police shootings are really awful, and uh, women also experience physical violence by police officers, and they're experiencing sexual violence and extortion. And that, that happens particularly in the context of the war on drugs, where an officer can say, I could charge you with something that could take you 25 years, uh, mandatory minimum penalty, you could lose your kids, your life, your family, your job, or you could do this for me. And there are officers on trial in LA right now uh, for extorting sexual contact from people um, on that basis, and, and that happens everywhere, every day across the country. There's one study that finds that law enforcement officers are caught in an act of sexual misconduct every five days. And I've just really even noticed that. I've been writing a piece for Think Progress on this, and we keep like moving the news hook to the latest story, which happens roughly every five days, right? Um, but they also found that internal affairs just did not investigate the cases. So going back to like, why would you have police officers investigating police officers, particularly when it comes to sexual misconduct? They, the internal affairs would not interview the complaining witness for months, half interviewed the police officer and then kind of let it go. Um, didn't look at forensic evidence, didn't look at, you know, and, and that's a, a consistent problem across the country is not only that this is a pervasive form of police sexual violence or violence that we don't talk about, but that it's one that is routinely under investigated, under documented, and certainly there's no efforts to prevent, detect, or ensure accountability for it. And um, that's an area in which I really hope we can move forward uh, more quickly. And we are going to have to get you to a uh, plane, but um, we have time for this, this last question here, and also time to sign books, right? Yeah, so that's why we're going to end the conversation. You, you can ask questions of Andrea um, while she's signing books, but right here, your la the last yes. question. Um, do you believe that it would make a positive impact on our justice system if we had our men and women in blue getting and receiving higher education? I think that it's a similar issue around um, level of education. I don't think that having more education makes you hold less bias necessarily, right? Um, some people go to law school and say really racist things, who are attorney general of this country, for instance. So, um, so I just want to point out that higher education doesn't necessarily mean anything other than you have a degree, that you're able to complete certain requirements. Um, so I don't know that the research is conclusive on that. Um, well, let me stop you on that, because I, re I recall when I was living in New York City that one of the, one of the requirements that they put in, that they in instituted, that new, new cadets had to have Either community college or two years of, of of a four year of a four year college, and hasn't New York City seen an improvement in the the cadet course since that was put in? Or no, no. no. Okay. I mean, can you, can you see I'm Andrew's like, face? I'm like, like Eric no. Garner. <laughs> I just I could just oh, go on, right? right. Like I think um, that in fact, when you look at police misconduct, for the most part, it's happening. Um, I mean, there are many long-standing police officers who engage in it, but rookies are particularly um, people in the first five years of their service tend to be most responsible for physical violence. They're certainly found to be most responsible for sexual misconduct. There's I, I haven't seen that improvement. Mm -hmm. And I also haven't seen the number of police shootings go down. In fact, they keep going up every year. 
right? So I just don't know that these reforms that we're talking about are having the effect. I think we've tried them. They're not having the desired effect. And I think at this point, it's really about reducing police contact and reducing criminalization as the response to everything and finding uh, different ways of responding to harms in our community. But we have to find those ways because we want to make sure that everyone actually has access to safety, the things they need, the things they need to thrive, um, not just survive. So that's what I would recommend with that. And with that, we're going to leave it there so Andrea can, can sign books and probably take more of your questions. But Andrea Ritchie, thank you very much for being here. Again, her, the name of her book is Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. And Kai, thank you very much for putting this together. Congratulations on a great, on a great event. Yes, I just really want to lift up Kai and thank you so much for making this conversation possible because, again, it's black women who are making these conversations possible. And I just really want to appreciate and thank Jonathan Capehart, who is just a tremendous uh, thinker, writer, um, and uh, conversation partner on these issues. And I learn something every time we talk together. So I'm really grateful for you. You're most kind. Thanks. <laughs>